Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the Restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Peiniger, and through a, a bunch of fortuitous events that were beyond our control, technology, and also the kids were were, were streaming yesterday during a snow day while I was trying to <laughs> interview my guest on a panel discussion, which, by the way, this might even come out before this, but I want to preview it. This is called Writing Mormon History, Historians in Their Books, and we had this powerhouse panel of people who were super awesome. And Joe Geisner uh, is the one that uh, helped organize this. He was the editor of the series. And one of the names you'll see on here, if you can just barely make it out, it's Stone, Daniel Stone, what wrote a chapter. And what this is actually a fascinating book. And by the way, later this year, this spring before Mormon History Association, volume two of this series will be coming out. Of course, folks, this is the gentleman. I interviewed him in the summer of 2021 up in Live Oak, Florida, where, where I was a property that I would take care of during the summers. And we it was a nine o'clock on a Sunday night. <laughs> we just turned on the camera and we talked about William Bickerton, a forgotten Latter-day prophet. And I'm going to leave links. So we're not really going to talk about William Bickerton in this, in this interview, because of course, we already have that interview and we have the book. I'll leave links in the description for you to be able to purchase the book. And at the end card, at the end of this, there will be, I'll have the, the interview of Daniel available so you can check that out. Uh, Daniel Stone is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, the headquartered in Monagahilla, Pennsylvania. And we are joined here today by his lovely wife, Laura. Laura, welcome to Mormon Book Reviews. Thank you. The reason why, actually, I was talking to Daniel on the phone earlier today, and he goes to me and he says, uh, so basically, long story short, we were like, okay, we were doing this panel discussion, and then all of a sudden, Daniel was our last person, and we'd already taped two and a half hours, by the way, at this point, folks, it was epic. Mm -hmm. And we were about ready to hear, hear Daniel's story, and his internet was kind of crappy, and so we weren't <laughs> able to do it. And I just said, you know what, Daniel, we just got to go ahead and tape a separate segment, so that's what we're doing today. So th so that that's this will be the part that we would have heard yesterday, but actually, I think it's going to be better because we're going to get color commentary from Laura, because you had mentioned to me that she was reminding you of a lot of things that you had forgotten about as you were kind of strolling down a trip down memory lane. Now, yeah, I want to talk yeah. about this church, <laughs> the Church of Jesus Christ, and I want to share this image. So this is a their edition of the Book of Mormon, and mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've talked about this uh, church a ton of times, you all know, and I had uh, the, the apostles sign their names and give me their very favorite Book of Mormon verse. And I thought that was really cool. And and Joel cool. Gailey, the president of the church, actually was the individual who went around and collected those signatures for me, which I was really touched by. And as we're taping, I'm actually be picking up Josh Gailey at the airport tomorrow cool. because this weekend they're going to be doing a preaching service at the uh, Forest Hills Congregation in Holiday, Florida. And I intend on being there. And there might be a couple other YouTubers coming as well. Let's cool. See. Yeah. So it's nice. really exciting. And uh, so we're, we're, you know, I have this great, unique friendship with the Church of Jesus Christ. I'm very, very good friends with many of the apostles, uh, with Josh Gailey, who's a, who's a 70. And really just, and actually we just, we just, we, we'd made a, a term, we actually came up with a term for me. They have the 70 uh, when it comes as the evangelist of the church, but I'm number 71. So uh, <laughs> for all the evangelization cool. I do for the church as well. And uh, I guess, folks, you could say that my relationship with the Church of Jesus Christ is very, very close. I was telling Mom earlier today, and I was going to use this analogy, is that, you know, of all the chur different churches in the Restoration that I put my thumb on the scale the most for is probably the Church of Jesus Christ. So you all know that I love you. I'm very close. And I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't, I show my bias that, you know, I do praise your church. And of course, in the month of December, I went down to Utah to witness the very first baptism into the Church of Jesus Christ by somebody who lives in Utah. So it was a history-making moment, moment that we filmed, and we actually interviewed the person that was was uh, baptized, and just got to participate in history and also attend the very first church service of the Church of Jesus Christ that Sunday morning, which was a mix of independent restorationists. There were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints there. There was you know, a room full of about a couple dozen people, and we fellowshiped and had church service together. And it was a beautiful nice. thing. And we all sung from... The Songs of Zion hymnal, yeah. which of course that church loves. And just last year, and just so you know, I was actually told that the Songs of Zion's hymnal was going to become an official church hymnal before it was announced to the public. So it's just kind of cool to be nice. privy to that. 
So when I say this, I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of building up here, folks. I, I want to make it very clear that Daniel is going to be talking about writing the book, William Bickerton's biography. OK, and he's going to be talking about some things that maybe some members of the church might not be entirely. Maybe they haven't heard before or maybe they won't be entirely comfortable. But I really feel like Daniel, I told him, I said, listen, Daniel, you tell your story. So Daniel's going to tell his story because there was some tension there about you writing a history and there's been tensions in the past about other people writing histories of the church that you probably want to touch base on and so i'm going to be very sensitive here but i also want to tell the story as daniel daniel experienced it and let him, give him the opportunity to tell some stories he's never told before about some of the some of the challenges he faced as a person who was going to finally write the first scholarly history of the church of jesus christ and the challenge that they presented and of course, folks, of all the places, if I'm talking to the members of the Church of Jesus Christ, of all the places where you would want Daniel to tell that story, I imagine you probably couldn't think of a better place than NBR to tell the story. So with that long introduction, sure. Dan Stone and Laura, welcome to the program. I'm really excited about this. And Dan Daniel, I'm, I'm glad we're, you're, you're going to tell your story. And then Laura, I think what we're going to kind of do like color, you're going to add something because of course you're, 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 you're here as his partner and you're seeing things and experiencing things as well. And of course, both of you were born in the church. So this is your church. You guys are faithful members yeah. of the Church of Jesus Christ. Love the Church of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And, and and so and you're raising your children in the Church of Jesus Christ. So we're making yeah, that are. abundantly clear to everybody. We okay. are this is a three-way conversation with three people that love the Church of Jesus Christ very, very much. And I tell people mm -hmm. it is like family to me. So Daniel. I am just, uh, you're an interesting dude. I really thought our interview was really good. I even remember going to you when I did this interview. I said, listen, nobody knows anything about William Bickerton. So I'm just going to turn the camera on. And if you're going to get 15 minute long answers, just get 15 minute long answers. And you did. And you did. I did. Yes. <laughs> We're not doing that Long tonight. Did. We're no. not doing that tonight. But, <laughs> but I think it's important that we kind of get an overview of your story. So Daniel, I just, I want to say, what was it like? First of all, what got you interested in writing a history of William Bickerton? And then just talk about maybe some of the some of the stuff that um, happened to you in this journey. And then we'll just kind of I'll ask some follow up questions and Laura can provide color commentary. Yeah, Laura was my research partner the entire time. And honestly, if I wasn't married to her, I probably the book probably never would have happened. And that's the story. That's part of the story that no one's ever really known before. So I guess in the end, like I was always thank you, Steve. I couldn't have said it a bit of better intro than that. So thank you so much. I agree with you on everything you said. But yeah, like I got interested in history. I've always loved history growing up and being in the church and being in a restoration church. History is very important. Right. And occasionally you would hear about this guy, William Bickerton, that started the church. But there was really like nothing on him other than like this, like this vision that he had. I'd occasionally hear because I went to a branch. We call our we call our church's branch. I went to a branch where several one of the elders specifically was really into history. And then another one was into history. So they always really liked it. So I, I heard stories, but I just didn't. I wanted to know more about William Bickerton. So when I studied history and when I went to the University of Florida, I always had this like desire that I was going to write a book on William Bickerton. Like I wanted to know more. And I kind of was hearing bits and pieces that like it would be hard because, you know, where are the documents? You know, what's do, do I have access to the church archives? What's in there? I mean, there was a lot of unknowns. So I, I really had that desire because there was very little written about him. And I love biography. So I guess in the end, the story about it is, is like, I, I was in a rock band. I was in a punk rock band. We almost got signed. And I kind of was like, I kind of quit that band so I could focus on like history and church and all that stuff. And, you know, looking back, I kind of think to myself, oh man, did I do right? But it ended up working out because I was able to write the book and it was put, to put my focus in it. And I met Laura during that process. I met her when I was at grad school studying American history with a focus on, a lot of it was on religion just real and, quick, just real quick, Daniel. What yeah. what what role did you play in the band? Oh, I was the bassist and the singer. Oh, so man, so they they you were the singer, so oh, you were probably not replaceable. No, he broke up the band. I broke up the band, and I am not it, like even to this day, I regret it. Like it was, you know, it was it was hard. It was not easy, and I I was in a band with my cousin, and we we were always in bands together. So it was like it was almost like breaking up. Not only with your band, but with your with your it was hard. And you know, looking back, I think to myself, oh gosh, like should I have done that? Maybe I should have done both. But it is what it is. I I I, I made that decision. But now I'm in a band with Laura. 
and I'm in a band again with my cousin. So it all works out. Awesome. <laughs> but we're back, we're back to sort cir circling, but awesome. Anyway, but anyways, yeah. So when I met Laura, I was telling her about my desire to do that. And she was like, you you met you told me about Jan Bork, right? Yeah. So a friend of mine growing up, her mother is the niece of the man that Daniel ended up getting these documents from. And she had said that her uncle just would not give the documents to anybody. Several people have asked for them, but he never trusted anybody. And uh, her and her mother were able to call him and say, Dana's a good guy. We met him, you know, trust him. He will do right by it. And then Daniel, a couple weeks later, got a call and said, hey, want to come to Kansas and get these documents? Yeah. Alex Robinson, mm -hmm. he, you know, and he, he had a ton of stuff he had done. He was in St. John, Kansas was where Bickerton was. And he had a ton right, of Just to be clear, just to be clear, this is St. John's, uh, Kansas was actually his attempt to start a a Zionist, a Zionist, Zionic community, if you will. So yep. that's very fascinating, yep. which would so ultimately a, lead to the split between the church as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. So he had a ton of information. The first historian to ever really do really good information on Bickerton was Gary Entz. And he was a really good scholar, did two great articles. He did a part of his dissertation was a huge chunk was about the Zionic, you know, community that Bickerton tried to create in St. John. And he got a lot of stuff from Alex because Alex had done the digging and the research through the microfilm. So mm -hmm. Alex was working on stuff. And yeah, like Laura said, he was so kind. He called me and he said to me, Daniel, I was really touched by this. He goes, Danny goes, I've been praying about it. I'm getting older. He was in his nineties or close to, and he said, he's like, I feel like I'm supposed to give these to you. And I've never given these to anybody. So that made me feel really good. So I, he like hosted me in his house, took me all around St. John. I took lots of pictures. He gave me all these documents, which was awesome. So that kind of put me out to the races, which was a lot of newspaper documents, which was awesome because, you know, like I didn't have like it wasn't just church documents. It was ton they, they wrote a ton in the newspapers. Mm -hmm. The middle of the book, especially when they're in Zion or in Zion Valley, that which later was changed to St. John, most of that's coming from the newspapers that the saints themselves, or I call them the saints, the people that were there, a part of the church, the Bickertonites, they were the ones writing the articles themselves, putting an editorial. So a lot of times people are like, oh, you can't really trust newspapers. It's like, well, you can trust these because most of these were written by the members themselves, which is pretty awesome because they were the ones starting the community from the ground up. So they were the ones writing the papers. It's really interesting. So Alex, so that got me off to the races, but like I needed to get church minutes. And so I, I had to like talk. So I talked with the general historian of the church after I got this information, which he was fascinated by the fact that I even got these documents, he was like, wow, like no one's ever been able to get stuff from him because he kind of like left the church kind of, or the church, it, that's complicated. He he feels like he got kicked out. He feels like the church left him versus kind of like what Bickerton is. So he had all this stuff and he was amazed that I got all this stuff and I showed him and I was like, I really would like to get the minutes. He's like, well, we need to write it up. A proposal to the apostles. So I wrote an a, a proposal to the apostles saying, like, can I please have access to the archives? And I need I specifically, I need like lots of documents, anything that's original, but I really need the minutes, especially. And I kind of said, I'm going to write an objective history. I want it to be scholarly as best as I can. I want to write it as somebody that like try like I'm this is not going to be a faith promoting book. Like I want it to be a historical book. And I specifically said that in the proposal. And eventually they gave me access to it, which I was so grateful. Um, and when I got those documents, it was funny because when I got the email from, it wasn't the general historian, it was another in individual that was a part of the historical committee. He sends me the email and I only got one document first before I was able to get other stuff in the archives. They didn't give me access to the archives yet. They just gave me the minutes. And it was a transcription of all these minute books that the assistant general historian Idris Martin had did in the past which was a really good transcription. He got a ton of stuff in there. It's a very, very big thing. And in the email, I got the email and then I got a phone call. And basically it was like, listen, if you have any, any like faith or issues or doubts, call me immediately. And I'm like, what? Like, why, why would I have faith doubts? Mm -hmm. Like, like, because I'm like thinking like, I got a mass, I got a, I got a bachelor's and a master's in history, right? Like I'm teaching college history at the time, like as a, as an instructor. 
so I'm like, I'm like, I'm a paid historian. So why are they saying this to me? This is kind of weird, right? <laughs> like, I was like, okay, well, thank you. I really appreciate it. I mean, I appreciated his care and concern. It was very nice of him. And I kind of said that to Laura, like, that's kind of funny. And you look into the history of it. And then this is where I kind of learned diving in. It's like, when you dive into the Bitcoin history, I was diving into the deep end right away. There was no shallow end. And in order to understand, as you know, yeah. And, and in order to understand Bickertonite history, and I have no problem saying Bickertonites, especially as a historian, Bickertonites, Bickertonites, it's great. Like it's a, it's, it's a good way to differentiate it. But like to dive into it, you've got to understand Mormon history. You have to, because Bickerton, William Bickerton comes out of the Mormon movement. A lot of people in my church have issues because there's this stigma of like, we're not Mormon, we're not Mormon because of all the stuff that's happened in the past, you know, the stigma, you know, it's like, I, listen, you and I know, like we love people, part of the LDS church. They're wonderful. And they have a very rich history, just like the Bickertonites have a rich history, like everybody does. But unfortunately, there's this stigma with all religions. It's goofy. I don't agree with it, but it is what it is. And there, so, but we come out of the Mormon movement. My church comes out of the Mormon movement. There's no getting behind that. I'm, I stick my, my, you know, my, I, I stick my, what do I, I don't know, my, my, my staff in the sand on that one, because we do. And you cannot understand Bickerton's story unless you understand him because he was a Mormon. Yes. He would join Sidney Rigdon's church. He joined Brigham Young's church. And then he started his own church. He was in the Mormon movement. And Bickerton had to constantly figure out like, what did he believe from his past being a Mormon? And what did he not believe? And you cannot understand him unless you understand the Mormon foundation. It, it, it carries on through throughout his entire life. So that's what's interesting about it. And what's interesting is when I got the minutes, so this is interesting. This is kind of like showing you the, the deep end of like what I was diving into. Idris Martin, who is the assistant journal historian, writes a little note on top of the transcription of the minutes to Robert Bob Watson, as he was known as Bob Watson, who was the general historian of the church. And he says, and I'll read it to you what he wrote. I actually wrote it in my dissertation for my PhD. So like, just to kind of understand like what I was going through. So I'll read it. I said, over time, others in the Church of Jesus Christ attempted to write more honest examinations of the church's history. Unfortunately, they received opposition from the church's leadership. Things like, I didn't really know this. Documentation about these incidents are scant, but one example is telling. During the 1980s, Idris Martin, the assistant general historian, transcribed large segments of the church's early minute books for publication. However, in a revealing note to Robert Bob Watson, the general church historian, Martin expressed his frustration that the church's leadership ultimately prevented the church historians from publishing the minutes. So this is why I kind of realized like, oh, like maybe this is why it's, maybe this is why they told me I need to worry about my faith because these minutes were, tr they tried to publish them and they were, they were stopped. He remarked, Bob, I am sure you have considered how strange it is that we have had so much opposition about our history being published. Martin then presented examples from the past that he believed paralleled their current situation. Quote, Brother William Cadman Sr. was asked by the conference of 1901 to write a brief history of the church to be read at the 40th anniversary celebration to be held in 1902, Martin reminded Watson. When he, when he Cadman, was asked to read the history, he confessed that he had not written anything on that line, then related many incidents of the past that would, quote, not have made a very pleasant history. <laughs> and then Martin gave other examples. A considerable manuscript was presented to the General Church Conference of 1903 by Brother Bickerton, but it was rejected because a part of it covered a per of the period of time, 22 years, in which he was separated from the church. After a few decades had passed, conference again asked Brother William Cadman Jr. to write the history of the church. The church did publish Brother Will's history of 413 pages in 1945, but Brother Will, no doubt, did remember the words of his father about the unpleasantness of the past. It did not write about the many times our brothers were misled by the revelations that were not of God, the serious public quarrels and failures, even the reorganization of the church in 1904, the incredible claims of greatness made by Brother Bickerton. In the end, Martin offered this conclusion. The only way you can learn about our church history is to read these 400 pages I have given you. They cover only the first 57 years of our history. I have tried to write these pages as an exact copy of the minutes written by our brothers of old. We cannot change what they have written. 
that's how he started his transcription of the minutes. So I was like, holy crap. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, oh, okay. So then you realize, like, and then I found out looking into Idris Martin, he ended up leaving the church. I don't know all the details about it, but every single person, as far as I know, that tried to write an objective history of the church that was in the church or tried to do objective things with the history of the church, they all left the church for the most part, as far as I know. I think yeah. I'm the first one that stayed. And and then so that so there was a sense that hey there was a there's there's a possibility that they probably thought it could happen to you, absolutely. And it's interesting to uh, you know, and I think would you say in large part the reason why these pre these people who had previously attempted to write the histories of the church left the church was as much because that there was opposition to their work and it kind of caused them to be frustrated and also yeah. Okay. I think it really stems from is that we're a small group, especially in the United States, right? And so everybody knows everybody. Everybody's very close. Everybody's considered like you're you're kind of taught in in a lot of ways. It is true. You're like family. So when you're family, and this is where it comes down to pride, and I'm going to put my own personal opinion in there, where you have elders who think that they are holy, that they can just like domineer over people. And be demanding of people who are also like your equals, right? But they're a part of your congregation. Every single religious organization and non-organizations, we have that. It's the pride of man, right? You see that. And this is oftentimes what makes people leave. Idris Martin, I have some of his um, journals and I kind of read some of the things he wrote. And he was very hurt by a lot of stuff that he had encountered. And then... I knew that. So then I, so I got this stuff and then eventually I got access to the archives, which was really cool. And I got to dig through a lot of stuff. I got really cool pamphlets. I got like copies of the ensign. Laura was with me. It was super awesome. Got to go through all this. It wasn't really organized like it is now. So it really was just like tr going through papers in a room in the, the headquarters in Greensburg. We spent my birthday weekend going through the archive. You're making me look bad. My birthday, <laughs> we were sitting in a library going through microfiche, looking for <laughs> newspaper articles. So I was right there with them, helping them do stuff. Yeah, she's not making me look very good. I kind of sold it to her. I'm like, listen, we'll go to Pittsburgh for your birthday. But while we're there, can you help me go through microfilm? <laughs> <laughs> At like California, with University of California, California, Pennsylvania. Like, can you help oh, me yeah. go through that microfilm? And then we went to the the um we went to the Heinz History Center and yeah. we got to see like an original hymnal from the church. We went through a ton of microfilm. No, there she was a rock star. She found a ton of stuff for me. It, he would tell me like what topic we were looking for, <laughs> what dates, what person, and I could just scan and go there. And then I would hop to the next computer and I go, "What do you want me to look for now?" And then I would scan <laughs> through and find stuff. And then he would actually read it and get the context of it. But we made a good team. Yeah, she we was. Made a good team. She was awesome. So like, yeah, so I basically I had to find stuff. So the archives, I got a ton of stuff. She helped me with all that. We went, we spent several times in Pittsburgh and she helped me go through all that. And then I was told by the general historian later on. So I'm like learning piecemeal. Like so you can see, it's a step-by-step -step process. I'm just, this is the research phase. I spent, how many years did I spend researching? Five, six years, all out of our dime. She was, this is why I needed her on here because she was a saint. Like this people like you said and it made me feel really good because you said last time we talked that people sometimes ask about me like oh where's daniel i spent so much time doing research and going to conferences and spending so much money of our own money doing this thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars in time i even took my full-time job and convinced my bosses to let me work part-time so i could do the research and write i mean it was i'm basically paying penance to her now because i don't go to these things anymore for a while because it's just like i spent so much time i need to be with my kids and my wife <laughs> but um anyway so yeah we, we so we went well, through that real so quick, anyways, real quick, Jones, real quick. mormon history association is in cleveland this year i'll be there presenting i don't know that's not too far from you no it's very close it's very close like three three four yeah. hours no it's only like two and a half. Oh, two and yeah. a half. Okay. Just yeah, the rock, we can go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame over there. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, so I told the general historian. So the general historian of the church was a real was a real good friend. He kind of then, after all this, let me go through the archives, giving me the minutes and all that. He then says, you know, you had a really good success with Alex Robinson, which is like fantastic. And he's like, and I never expected that to happen. Maybe God will bless you and you can have access. And he told me the story about how a lot of the original minutes of the church were actually get, ha, had by this one by this wonderful man in my opinion 
um, that was in uh, New Mexico. And the whole story behind how he got those minutes and why he has them, that is like, I'm not even going to get into that. I've heard several stories about it. And to me, all I know is, is that the man who gave them to me, he has the Lamb Foundation archives. He was so nice and generous to me. And so was the general historian. Everybody was very nice to me. I don't know why, but I'm very grateful for that. And he says, maybe you can talk to him. So, and that's the other thing. He ended up leaving the church and a friend of his ended up leaving the church because again, they were trying to do historical things with the church and they, it, there was some disagreement and I won't get into the specifics about it, but it got to the point where again, they left. So again, this is why I think people were nervous about me. Um, and so anyways, I, I got, he's like, why don't you talk to them? So then I, I, so what I ended up doing was, was like, well, let, I basically played a card like with Laura. I said, well, you know what? It works last time where if I knew somebody who knew me and then knew them, they could put in a good word for me. So I found someone that I was friends with that knew not the man in New Mexico, but the other guy that worked with him and because they had left the church and they were still friends. So I said, can you put in a good word with me with this person and ask him if he can put in a good word with me with that person who's got the minute or like all these documents so I can have them? And she was like, oh, sure. And she did that for me. She wrote like a nice letter, a nice email. And he called me and was like, because she told him what I wanted to do, how I wanted to write an objective history. And he was so nice and said, just be careful when you do it. We got railroaded. You know, you know, he was not happy about it. And he's like, just, you know, but and I'm going to put in a good word for you. He put in a good word for me. That person not only contacted me and he literally said, he, go, he said to me, he goes, I've never done this for anybody. He goes, I'm going to FedEx you everything that I have. He goes, I'm going to spend the next like weekend. And I'm going to, I have everything. Did I have a ton of stuff digitized. I have most of it transcribed. He hired somebody to transcribe everything. So I had things that were text searchable. So, and then he's like, and I'm just going to give you access. And then he kind of was like, so then he was just like, all I ask is that like, what I give you, just use it for the book. And he even had me sign something. He said, just use it for the book. I've never done this for anyone. So I did. And also the agreement was too, when I did got the stuff from the general historian and from the church and from the apostles was that this is for your book. Don't give it out to anybody. So from both sides, I was told this is for your book. Use it only for your book. You can quote as much as you want. You can cite as much as you want, but do not publicly post it on the internet or anything like that. So I was like, okay, that's the requirements I had under the church and under this person. So again, things kind of just started falling into place with that. And that, so it's, as you see, it's, it was a lot of political maneuvering, unfortunately, and just people talking because, you know, it's, and, and people in the LDS, other LDS historians, especially the ones who got into new Mormon history, they can obviously understand and relate. I'm kind of late in the game, you know, with the Bickertonites, but this was, this is what they had to do doing the early history of the church before we had the Joseph Smith papers and before the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was very open and more open with their history because before they weren't, before Leonard Arrington, they were not open about their history. He was the one that really pushed the door open for them. But even in like the official ways that he got documents, but we also got documents in some extremely random ways of, uh, we were at conference in Pennsylvania yeah. and we had this um, older brother <laughs> come up to us with this paper, like, giant eagle paper bag and say, hey, I have some documents for you, here you go. And later on in the evening, we went through it and he's like having a heart attack. I'm like, what's going on? We're at my like, aunt's house. I have my hands on a paper from 1930s. No, 18, oh, 1830. 18, like 18, 18, 18, no, it was 1870s, I think. From yeah, Alexander Cherry. Oh, yeah. That was, I, okay, I'm sorry. That was. hand wrote and he had the paper in a giant eagle paper bag. We were just yeah. given this document. Just crazy. <laughs> yeah, that was another one. He was like, you should talk to this person. And he went to Monongahela, which is considered our headquarters, mm -hmm. which I'm not really sure why, because we don't do any headquarters stuff there, but it is what it is. I don't know. But anyways, they have, so that's like one of the oldest branches and they have like a safe with all these documents and mm -hmm. they never gave them to the archive, which was funny. And I kind of learned that too. For whatever reason, Monongahela did not, I think eventually they did give it all, but for a long time, they were, I don't know if the branch didn't want to give it to the general church for whatever reason. So I talked to somebody who was, I think the historian and he was an elder there. I won't say his name because I don't want to get in trouble. He's passed on, but he's a wonderful, wonderful man. And I told him a little bit about what I was doing and he was so nice. He says, you know what, Daniel? He goes, I like what you're doing. He goes, you know, and he kind of said the same thing to me. He goes, just be careful. There's a lot of people that might not like what you're doing. There's a lot of family heritage that are going to get upset. And he's like, so just be careful. And I was like, okay. He's like, I'll get back to you. 
And then sure enough, I found out. So when he gives me this paper bag, I'm like, well, thanks so much. And he's like, well, he's like, just look at it later. Just look at it later. Because we were at like a conference. I don't think he wanted people to know he was giving it to me. It was like literally original documents from the 19th century and, and the early just to 20th be clear, century. These came from that safe. Yes. He took them out of the safe. He took them out he, of the safe, gave them yes. to you and told you, you can have these. But you got to bring give, give them back to the church. Is that correct? Yes, tell exactly. Us they were from the safe, but we're putting two and two together. Oh, yeah, got it. Okay, because he, he told he well he eventually told me where they okay. were from. Okay. He told me that. he goes I took these out of the safe and I wasn't supposed to. Okay. <laughs> so he said he said so so he kind of stole them, but he didn't really because he said I just I'm giving this to you. I trust you, and I mean it was a ton of stuff. And he says just uh, promise me you'll take good care of them and you'll give them back to the church when you're done. He goes, these are out of the safe, so at least you know where they are at. So when I cite them, I cite them to the archives because that's where I gave them. But really, they're from the Monagahela safe, which is pretty wild. And I got those. And nobody knew that I had those. Like, I actually, and so I think he trusted me because I'm an archivist. That's what I do for a living. So I literally bought, like, the acid-free archival folders. We bought a fireproof, waterproof safe. I put all those documents in there. And I say I preserved them better than they were in the Monagahela safe. So that way, if my house burned down or, you know, it was carried away in a flood, they still would have been safe. And I ended up giving them away to the archive. So stuff like that, just so funny. Got in a giant eagle supermarket bag, like these documents from the 19th century, which was wild, that nobody knew existed. And like, and I even took scans of some of them and put them in the book, which was pretty funny. So yes, it was a lot of people doing things that they probably maybe shouldn't have done or were open, more open to doing things and they gave them to me. So that's kind of the story of behind it. And then I started writing the book and I started looking into it. And one of the things that shocked me about writing the book, am I talking too much, Stephen? You're doing just fine, my okay, friend. Thanks. So thank you. So like, as I'm writing the book, one thing really shocked me was that I never knew this, that Bickerton had the, the, the Job 19 read at his funeral for like his, like his like eulogy. Mm -hmm. And that's not a want something you really want read at your funeral he had the whole chapter read sometimes they read this they read the part for eulogies where it's like you know oh, I'll, I'll see my savior or something like that there's a nice part to it but the whole thing is very sad it's about my kinsfolk part of it goes my kinsfolk have failed and my familiar friends have forgotten me and then he goes all of my words were now written that they were printed in a book that they were engraved with an iron pen and the lead in the rock forever and i realized at that moment doing all the history to make it the story short, was that Bickerton, he was so disheartened when he died, he had this read basically to say, and he had one of the apostles of the church read it, that was his friend, basically saying, I have been disowned by my own church for for for, unre for wrong reasons, and so please someone write my story. Like mm -hmm. that shook me when I read that, because he, in his biography as idris martin wrote he wrote a biography of his own story that the church refused to publish and give out because it talked about the 22 years of his life where he was still doing stuff and doing missionary work and things like that and the church didn't want to acknowledge that because he was technically kicked out of the church during that time that's why would they wouldn't publish it so he at his deathbed is literally saying they have forgotten me and they're they're basically pushing me aside like that was hard to read. I'm not going to lie. Like that was really kind of like heart wrenching or you realize like you're writing the story of this man who died in agony. And that's, and I realized like, Oh crap. Like now I realize that like, A, it makes a great story, but B, it makes you sad because you realize this is a real person. This isn't just like a story. This is, this isn't like a fake narrative of a fairy tale. It's real. And then you realize like, you got to tell this story. And, like, and, how, and then it's like in one sense, Daniel, He's talking to you when you're reading that. Thanks. That's how I felt. And it, it was very ominous in a way. Yeah. So, very, so you feel a real connection to this person. And so yeah. it's almost like you have a sacred duty to, to do this. Oh, thanks. That's kind of how I felt because all these things fell into place, right? Like, and every person kept saying, we've never done this before. The general mm -hmm. historian was like, we've never really done this before. We're going to try it again. And all the people who left the church who had stuff were like, we've never done this before. They it, thank thank God they liked me. And I liked them. They were very, very friendly, treating me like like their kid. It was wonderful. So and then I read that and I'm like, oh, crap. Now I got to tell this story. And I tell Laura this like, oh, crap, like this is going to blow the roof off. Like, like literally like the story of Bickerton was never told. And you realize why it was never told, because 
the guy who wrote the official heritage history of the church, like I call it, and I'm not bashing it by calling it a heritage history. William H. Cadman put a ton of really good stuff in the first volume of the church. He really did. But like Idris Martin wrote in his note to Bob, he left a lot of stuff out. And there's a reason for that. It was because his father, William Cadman and Bickerton, really had it out to each other. And Cadman wrote some really, really nasty things to Bickerton publicly in the newspapers. Bickerton, believe it or not, never wrote anything nasty back to him, which I thought was incredible. He basically said Bickerton was possessed by the devil. He called him Beezlebub and like said like, oh my gosh, like just the weirdest, like funniest things. When you read it now, it, like it, it makes you laugh because it was so ridiculous and heinous. And you're realizing like, oh crap, like this is an apostle of the church writing this publicly to Bickerton. So I don't think William H and William H really kind of sided with his father's side of the story. And you can read in the book why, because Bickerton was accused of adultery. Most likely it was not true. And it, there's a whole story behind that, which I'll let, you know, the interview that I did with you prior, we go into that and read the book. It's very, it's very much a soap opera and it's absolutely fascinating. And even if you're into, if you're into women's rights, you will love that story. It was very good. But, um, so, but anyways, so he writes this heritage history of it and you realize like, oh crap, this isn't the story. This isn't real. This isn't the whole story at all. Like they literally gloss over 22 years of history like where he's completely gone. And actually they gloss over basically all of Bickerton's life in general. They barely mention Bickerton in the, in the history of the church, in the early history of the church, in the heritage history of the church. How do you do that? I don't understand. Like to me, it was like, it was very clear. And Idris Martin, again, talked about that. And you realize like, I realized, oh crap, I, I jumped into a minefield. Mm. But, you know, my I'm not afraid of it. Like I wanted to do it. And I want, and you know, so then as I'm writing this, all of a sudden, I get this email from the general historian saying, hey, would you mind pausing for a second? I need to talk to you. So he's talking to me. He goes, the apostles are talking. And one of the apostles, who I will say is a Cadman descendant, basically said, I need you. He wa he really wants people to be like more observing you as you're or working with you as you're working as you're working on this. He didn't use the word observe. He used work with. But you were sending every chapter. Yes, I was. To the historians to read and yes. edit and review. And yeah, you know. and they were, and they were reporting back because that was the deal was that like, I'll work with this. Hopefully the church will publish it. I'm going to be completely transparent and give you everything that I'm writing. And I was, thank you for saying that. See, this is why I have her. And she's basically and, and I'm saying like, here's my stuff. Well, they're they're hearing about it, right? Or maybe even reading it. I don't know. And then he was basically said, like, he wants his two sons to work with you and to like basically like have you work on. And I said to the general historian, like, oh gosh, like, like and I said, I'm not opposed to them. They're really smart guys. Like I flat out said that. Like, I like them, but like, isn't this kind of weird? Because like I'm not a descendant of any family. Like, I'm from an Italian family. Like, I'm not a Cadman. Like and I'm doing a Bickerton and like the whole history is written by this. So what do I do? He's like, just work with them. So I wrote an email. So I'm like, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. Cause I wanted more access to the stuff, right? I want to make the church happy. So I write, so I write, I write a message to the people. They don't really get back to me. Eventually I get an email back and it's basically like, listen, I've read your stuff. And it was from the person, the sons that wanted to work with it. And they're like, we don't really like one of them was like, I don't really like what you're writing. Um, I don't agree with some of it. Like, I don't like that you're using the Sidney Rigdon biography stuff, you know, and I'm just like, well, that's a great biography. Like, I mean, uh, people have issues with it because uh, um, because the author of it basically tried to say Sidney Rigdon was manic depressive or bipolar, which I mean, okay, if you don't agree with that, that's fine. But the nobody, you ask any historian, most historians will tell you that the, the research of like what, of Sidney Rigdon's life and the footnotes are just phenomenal in that book. It won several awards because of that footnoting and research, which is what I was using a lot to find these original documents. And also just to tell the story of Bickerton with Sidney Rigdon. And then they also said like, we don't agree the fact that like, you're saying that, you know, Joseph Smith practiced polygamy because in the beginning of the book, I kind of have to tell the story of like Mormon history. And I basically said Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. And they were like, yeah, that's not true. Most likely that's not true. But Joseph Smith didn't practice polygamy. And there was some other stuff. And I was like, oh, gosh, like, what am I going to write? So I tried to be polite right back. And it was kind of like a little bit of a back and forth. It seemed friendly, but like it was very kind of like, no, you can't do this. Oh, and you can't use the minutes because you can't write a history only using the minutes. Like there's not enough information. Like you shouldn't even do it. And I mean, that's a historical opinion. 
But I've also read several writings where you just, as long as you're saying that up front, and I had a lot of not only minutes, but a lot of er, uh, uh, earlier documents and a lot of newspaper articles. So like I had a lot to work with. And as long as you make that known in the beginning, which I do, that, yeah, I'm going to have to speculate sometimes, but there's a lot of stuff written in the minutes. These minutes are not just like, we had a service. It started at 10 o'clock. We read this hymn. We did, we say, we, 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 ha we heard this sermon from these chapters of the Bible. We closed in prayer with this. It's not like that. People write like essays and leave like whole sermons and transcribe whole sermons. They have like revelations, tongues, things written. And I mean, it is like, it is a treasure trove. I read several things to Laura. It's not regular minutes. It's really interesting. And they were all handwritten and very not tidy. And they were very hard to read and misspelled. And my mom would sit down at the kitchen table with Daniel and help him transcribe of what are they saying in this thing? Yeah. He couldn't figure out what the, the handwriting was the terrible. Handwriting and, <laughs> and she grew up with a family in Arkansas that could not really read or write. And when they learned, it was really bad. So she could read it really well. <laughs> and she helped me transcribe a lot of this stuff, which was a pretty incredible. So I'm really grateful to your mom yeah. for that. So yeah, like, and eventually he was just kind of like, we're not, I don't, I have, I don't have enough time to work with you on this, but I don't think you should do this writing. And I was just kind of like, all right, well, I guess that's fine. Like, so it kind of worked, I mean, in a way it worked out because I didn't, I was still had that freedom and they kind of chose not to do it. Well, then I found out that like some of the apostles were not happy that they, that the, they chose not to do that. Or at least that's what I heard. And I was, but I was on my own and I'm like, okay. So again, like you have this thing where it's like, see, there, there's this, this is my opinion. You have this fear where you have to protect like the church. You have to protect like, and I, and like, you have to protect like the, like what was already taught or even the family heritage. It's like, there's a lot with any religion. There's a lot, of, especially if your family's in it for a long time. And this goes for everybody. It's not just for this person. It could even go for me. You, you, your identity is attached to this in so many ways. It's like embedded in you. So if you have this thing where you kind of know like, oh crap, there might be something coming out. Like you might want to make sure that it's not going to be, you want to kind of keep an eye on it. Like that's kind of how I felt like, and I was willing to do it, but I wasn't really that keen on it, but I kind of just went along with it anyways. And this is a story I never told, but Laura, well, you remember me talking with you about it being like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, because I know, because now that I'm reading this stuff, I know what's going to come out and I'm only seeing the surface. Once I really start digging, I'm going to really see there's going to be a lot of stuff and it's not going to be good on Cadman. It's going to look really bad and I can't sugarcoat it. And it's got, and Bickerton's going to look bad at times too. And I can't sugar that. I can't sugarcoat that either, but it's history. We as people suck. <laughs> I don't understand why it's so hard for, like, I won't get, I'll get on my soapbox for a second. Human beings suck. I suck sometimes. My wonderful wife, she never sucks, but like everybody else sucks. Mm -hmm. And even religious people suck. Like, and I don't understand why that's so hard. We just need to grasp it and accept it. Yes. Like we have pride. I, I totally agree with you. And I and I actually talked to Latter-day Saints in Utah, um, just even regular ones, and say, listen, the Kendall image that you've created of Joseph Smith, it really un it really it 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 actually uh does more harm than good. Yes. Because the reality is is that Joseph Smith was a man. He was flawed at times. He did he did things that I don't agree with. Um, there's a lot of accusations leveled against him and some may be true. Some may not. I'm, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm just neutral on all of this, but I tell people, I said, Joseph Smith, actually, as a flawed human being, let's just take all the accusations, everything negative that was ever said about Joseph Smith and say, okay, that's all true. He actually fits in better as a producer of scripture than the Kendall hagiography edition of Joseph Smith. hundred percent. Because when evangelicals attack Joseph Smith and his character, I'll be like, okay, are we talking about King David or Solomon? Right. Okay. That's what we that's, say all the time. Yeah. Yeah. That's my point too. That actually, if you want, if you want to actually have make the claim that Joseph Smith is an authentic producer of scripture, he actually fits in better as a, a man of flesh and bone, a man with flaws, a man who was not perfect. And Actually, I think it actually strengthens the case. That's the argument I make. I think that's, that's, and I think all too often, and again, evangelicals do the same thing. 
you know, the movies they make about biblical times, every season, you know, real clean and everything, you know, Jesus got blonde hair and, you know, everything, everything, there's this image that we have that we've all created that we want to live. And, and then, and then when we, you know, it's like so many people had problems when, you know, I helped kind of, kind of break the story with the Joseph Smith photo. Right. That was awesome. And, yeah. and people didn't like this because it didn't comport with what they had pictured Joseph Smith as being. Now, by the way, folks, just, you know, this, his hair was actually much lighter, but the way the daguerreotypes that were done, this showed up as darker. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, this is really, this is a real man. William Bickerton was a real man. Cadman, Cadman was a real man. And that's fine. It's, it, it's it, to me, it's even more beautiful as a result of it. Because it, it shows, like, because I always say, man, if King David and Solomon made it into heaven, we're good. Like, it, it gives hope for everybody. Yeah. Like, I mean, I don't know if they did or not, but, like, if they could have, then we're fine. We're going to be okay. Like, and I, I like that about the scriptures because because I really like would like to think, I mean, this is me putting my religious hat on, that God is merciful, right? And we need to know the good and the bad. They didn't hide it in the scriptures. So why are we so afraid? Why do we throw, I, I always call it heritage history. Why do we throw these heritage histories out there? They're so boring. And a lot of people don't like that. And people even feel like they have experiences where it's like, well, we shouldn't talk about the bad. It's not good. Where to me, it's like, I, I don't, you're losing out on the full drama and the struggle and the overcoming of that struggle. What, like when you, when you leave out the struggles, like, why would you do that? What a boring story it would have been if Jesus was like, yeah, I did these miracles and then I resurrected and it worked out great. Great. Yeah, like, well, how did you die? Yeah. Like what happened? Like well, did, you, did, your, did your disciples like dis, did your disciples like leave you? Like I mean, you know what I mean? It's like it's yeah. crazy to me. Well, like, this is the other, ones that religious people feel that way. See, and this is the other thing too, is like the idea of the restoration is to return to the primitive. I call the, the Church of Jesus Christ in particular the primitivists of the restoration. Right. I tell I call them the April 6, 1830 church. You know, they're, they're probably the closest to th that church, like that would be familiar to people. But I also like to point out that read Paul's letters. And he's talking about the church. It's a mess. Yeah. It has scandals. This is the early church that we all want to go back to. We want to do the first century church. Guess what, folks? There were people sleeping around with each other. There were scandals going on. There was it's all documented in the scriptures. And if you actually want to make a better argument then is is that tell the story the story has to be a full story and you need to include all the good and the bad because yeah. then it actually makes it more accessible and brings it down to a level that's that that we as humans can relate to these people and recognize they're just like us yeah 100%. And we, can, we can be used by god just like they were used by god and it and because un unfortunately i think people have in their mind this image of a man of god is this this and that well can't have some of those qualities, but we're all full humans and we all, we're all flawed and we all look through a glass darkly. Yeah. hundred percent. I couldn't have said it any better. And like we were talking about in the other interview when I kind of started and then my inter my internet crapped out. Whereas like I was saying within the Latter-day Saint movement, when you have history, we have every single Latter-day Saint church and not just any Latter-day Saint, a lot of churches, Christian churches in general, they have like this belief where it's like, we have to prove like we're the one and only true church. Like we're the primitive church. And like you said, I couldn't have said it any better. It's a mess. And it's a waste of time, in my opinion. This is just my opinion to even try to do that. Let's just talk about Jesus and getting people. Because that's what gets, like, if you want to put your religious hat on, God is what gets you into heaven. Being a good person is getting into is what gets you into heaven, not what church you join. Like, I don't understand. And there, when you're writing history, you have to, like, prove, like, well, our corporate entity with the, with the name and our doctrine as it is, is the true way where even in my church, I think that was something that was shocking was that the doctrine pretty much stayed the same, but the structure of the church, different beliefs. We had, a, we had, a, we had an ordained prophet, which we don't have anymore. Both. They were all ordained prophet seers and revelators. We had the three above the 12. We call it like the, the prophet who was the president. You had a first counselor, second counselor. They are all ordained prophet seers and revelators. You have other people that are talked about prophets. You have prophetesses, which we don't, I mean, we would may, maybe honor that, but pe you, they were like saying like, no, this person's a prophet. This person's a prophetess. And they're, or they're ordaining them that. We don't do that anymore. You have offices like priests that don't, we don't have anymore. Patriarchs, we don't have anymore. High priests we used to have in the Vicar Tonight Church. We don't have that anymore. So it's like doctrines change. And I think that's hard too. It's like, 
when you study religion, you realize it never, ever stays the same. And when Jesus, this is my opinion, when Jesus came, he established the way. All this structure, other than having the 12 and having some evangelists and having some women follow him, that was it. He died. All that structure came after him. And then we like to take it as canon and say, well, this book, the Bible, these men who we can't even prove if they actually wrote the book or not. I'm not bashing the Bible. I'm just speaking as a scholar. And then it's like we hold it as canon, as holy word of God. It's infallible that this structure of the church has to be the way it is. But as human beings, we are constantly evolving that structure. And even in the Bicker Tonight Church, that happened. Every single church religion doesn't matter. The the Mormon church, every single one, it's happened. And I feel like, like you were saying, that's where people go, oh my gosh, this they're not Ken dolls. Oh crap, they really did evolve and change their mind over time, even on the scriptures and how God talked to them. W what do we do with that? And they made mistakes too. Sometimes they had revelations and they weren't from God most likely. What do you do with that? This person's supposed to be a prophet. Well, guess what? Prophets can have false revelations and you're still a prophet. It's okay. I mean, if you want to look, look, look at it, or if you want to be a person of God, a, a woman or a man of God, you can have your, your, your moments of being a person and still be considered hopefully and good in the eyes of God. Why is that so hard to accept? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, and I tell people too, is that, you know, the, the, the disadvantage that Mormonism has, if you will, is um, the, the we get to read what the opponents of Mormonism had to say almost immediately. So in 1831, you had the book Mormonism Unveiled. Imagine that in the early church days, while Jesus's ministry is still going on, somebody wrote a manuscript, Christianity Unveiled. I think our view of Christian history would be much different. And honestly, I'll tell you evangelicals who love the bashing, by the way, they hated the fact that I went to that baptism last month. Okay, some, <laughs> some, some, okay, some. But, but I'm telling you, if if somebody was there documenting the history, early history of the of the early days, I think we'd have a much different view mm -hmm. of the early days of the church than what we have because we only hear one perspective, which is what we hear read in the Bible. We don't get to hear the anti-Christian literature, but we get to read the anti-Mormon stuff. So now we have a bit, so it actually kind of gives us a kind of a template of what it might have looked like in the early days of Christianity by looking at the early days. Of Mormonism. So that's just a thought I want to share. Because I think I think like, yeah. you know, actually it was John Dolan of all people went to me and said, and one of my interviews is we all could use epistemological humility. And I think that's what's really Amen. Hmm. <laughs> I could I agree with that. Could have said any better. Ab absolutely. So I, I wanna yes actually just kind of wrap this up a little bit here, but I want to make sure that we we touch base on uh, like I want to make sure that there's if there if there's more to this, some more points that you want to hit on. Yeah. Please, please. Okay. And I'll just hit the highlights because we're getting closer to the end, unless you have anything you want to say. Okay. So we'll just hit it. So eventually I'm writing the book, writing the book. I get to the point where, you know, Signature wants to publish. You can read it in Joe's right. wonderful So just to be book. clear, it's and it's actually talked about in this book, right? That yeah. Well, and it tells the story of how originally you were going to write for the church, but eventually you ended up being able to go with Signature Books. Yeah, because eventually I was told by the general historian that, like, listen, the apostles want you to change some things. And I was like, well, what do they want me to change? They're like, well, they want you to take out that they, Joseph Smith didn't practice polygamy. Some of them did. Not all the apostles did. He actually told me one of the apostles took him aside. And he's this apostle passed away now, so I can say this. The general historian was such a sweet man. He took me aside to make me feel better after I got this news. He said, you know, one of the apostles actually took me aside and said that this was the best history of the church he's ever read. And he he was kind of outnumbered, but he said it was fantastic and he wouldn't change a thing. And that made me feel really good. But the, there was a lot of them wanted me to take out that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy because I said like it was a historical fact. He did. I don't to me, I don't see how I mean, I, I have friends who wonderful friends who say that, but I just I don't agree with that. Historically, it's considered a fact. Um, but anyways, I said that there was other things like they didn't want me talking about how like you know, the church had false revelations. We had, we had offices that we didn't, that we don't have now. Like we did things differently back then that we don't have now. These were a lot of things they kind of wanted to look out and maybe take out smooth over. And I just did not feel comfortable with that. Like, I was just like, listen, do I say anything that's not true? And I'm not saying the general historian agrees with everything I wrote in the book. I, I know he doesn't, right? Like everybody has their own opinion on stuff, right? But I was the one doing the research, right? I'm the one really digging into this. And they're not. And I'm not bashing them. Everybody can have their opinion. But it's like, I was doing the work. 
hours upon hours. So to me, it's like, if I'm not writing anything mean and people know it's written by me, then like, why is this a problem? So I basically was like, listen, I think I have to go independent. And he was like, all right. So, and I said, well, here's the deal. Like, I'll continue to give you the, everything. Like, I'll be honest with you and I'll keep the apostles abreast of everything. And that's the last I kind of heard of it. Like, I was kind of assumed that, that that was allowed. I never heard anything otherwise after that conversation that I was allowed to do it. And then signature books, as Joe talked about, he met me. That, that It was very fortuitous how it happened. They were very interested in the book that, you know, and they, they, they were ready to publish it. So when it got to time to publish... And the manuscript was already given to, to Signature Books, and they basically were peer reviewing it at the time, and it looked like it was going to be accepted. Everything was looking really good. I get this letter. I went to work, and it was like 6 in the morning, and I get this letter in the email, and it was from the Quorum of 12. And it was basically saying, Daniel, please don't publish the book. Like, and I have it in the book that I write it, but I just basically said, we don't, we want to look it over it more, and we want to comb through it. And he basically said, we we understand that these were men and they said and did things that were not probably good. And we don't want people to get hurt. That, that, that basically said, like, there's people, there's family members and there's people in the church that have attachments to these things. And we don't want to hurt them. Or it, it, something like that. And basically, we, we don't want to hurt people's feelings. We don't want to and we don't want to make the church look bad. Again, it comes down to like. And I get it. I'm not bashing the apostles. Please hear me out. Their job is to protect the church. It's their job. I get it. My job as a historian is to, is to tell the history as best as I can interpret it. So it's hard. And I knew going into it, there was going to be this dynamic. And it wasn't like a mean letter, but it was basically like, please don't do this. And I wrote, this is where, and I, I was pretty naive. I was pretty like, Laura always used to call me a lamb. I'm not really a lamb anymore. I've kind of taken my punk rock Daniel Stone back. And now I'm more like willing to fight and stand up for myself. Back then I was a big lamb and I was like, but this is where I got to the point. I was like, no, I, I need to write a letter. So I wrote a letter back to them saying like, no, I can't do this. I'm, I got to tell the truth. I got to tell the truth how it is. It's not that big of a deal. And basically what you said is kind of what I said about like the Ken doll things of like, this is more damaging to the church by like, oh, and they also asked me, please don't talk about the 20. This is something really big in that letter. They specifically said, please don't talk about the 22 year history that Cadman and Bickerton fought. Please just take that out or in a nicer way. But they basically said, please take that out. We can't talk about that. And that's to me where I was like, I can't, I'm running a biography, the full life of Bickerton. I cannot take out 22 years of his life to do that. So I, I went with it anyways, and I never heard anything back from him. And then I got guff afterwards, you know, some of the family members, like people from church, like one person that has family ties said I was of the devil. Like, again, my internet kind of went out when I was doing like a presentation and they said it was God doing that because it, like goofy stuff like that. And I'm not trying to bash them, but what I'm saying is, is it's ridiculous to say that about people and it hurts people's feelings. Well, am I going to say that I was hurt by that stuff? Yeah, I was hurt by that stuff. I shouldn't, I'm not going to pretend that I wasn't because this is supposed to be my family, right? Well, they they wrote mean things about me online and then they had to edit them and I talked to them and then they re-edit them multiple times. They say I'm not qualified and it still hurts. I've made amends with them over, I, I don't care about it anymore, but I just wanted to show like, I don't go on the internet. When have I ever gone on the internet and said mean things about anybody like, like to say like, well, your work. I don't like it. I'm honest about my experiences that I've had with people. Maybe people don't like that, but nothing that I'm saying from my interpretation and from what I'm saying is true. I was told not to do this. I, maybe they have a different opinion on how, why it was done. Maybe I shouldn't have, maybe they say, maybe, a lot of people say, well, you went out of line. You should not have published this. You were supposed to do it with the church. I know I've hurt feelings with that too. And I get it. But in the end, like I was trying to write an objective history of the church. And like you said, Reading that Job 19, realizing that bigger, I'm sorry, I'm getting kind of like fired up here, but it's okay, true. So reading that made me realize that I had to do it. I had to tell his story. The guy literally died asking for it. And the church literally like just swiped it over and you don't want to talk about it. Like to me, it's ridiculous. And now, believe it or not, thankfully, and we'll end this on a good note, right? Yep. Like the church I think the biggest concern was people were going to leave the church. Nobody left the church, actually. <laughs> a couple of people bought the book and got baptized in the church, which I'm not trying to do. Like, I was trying to write a book 
And I actually had a couple of apostles come up to me and say, like, you know, I heard some people got a, got baptized. I think things have kind of come around. And I think family members or things, people still don't like why I did it. They don't like that I used the transcriptions or that some people don't like that I couldn't publish the minutes, which is funny because I was like, well, listen, I'd be happy to put this out in the public. But the church asked me not to do it. And the person who gave me the documents, all these people asked me not to do it. I have everything. And I was always told if I ever need to prove what I wrote, I'm happy to prove, show that. But like, I would be going against what the apostles asked me not to do to publish it. I'd be more than happy to do it. And I even was been working on a project to do that. But in the end, I kind of go back to that. You know what? I promised the church I wouldn't do it. So I kind of put a pause on it because I want to honor that. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not a... Like, listen, I don't care if people come up with different interpretations about my book in the end. I was the first person to do it. So did I make mistakes? Probably. Any historian does. History writing is not a science. You try your best to interpret it. And there's always going to be more interpretations. So if someone writes another, try to be objective biography of Bickerton and they disagree with me respectfully, that's awesome. That's the way it's all about. But I don't like trolling. I don't like people saying mean things that they shouldn't be saying, saying I'm not qualified or things like that. That's just rude and mean and hurtful. And it's not polite. So I, that's where I get to the point where it's like, you know, in the end, it's all better now because in the mm -hmm. end, and I, I believe I'm the first historian. And by the way, if I didn't write this book, I this is where the capstone of it, and I put it in Joe's book, I got my PhD because of writing this book. I wanted to always go back to get my PhD. They read this book and they said this book, they made me feel really good. They said, we're going to use this as part of your dissertation. So it cut my time to do the to do my dissertation in half because I did this. If I had listened and did not write the book, I would not have gotten my PhD. I would not have met amazing people like you, Stephen, or all these other people. I would not have traveled all across the country with Laura. We would have met amazing people, mm -hmm. historians, scholars, restorationists from all different pieces. I got invited to BYU more than once like several times to meet with wonderful, wonderful people. And I would not have gotten a promotion at my job. I still work professionally as a historian and an archivist because of all this. Like, I mean, it was like, personally for me, this is like God showering his blessings down upon me. Like, I can't, this is my religious hat. I can't say it any other way. I'm so grateful. And I feel like I got to know William Bickerton. Yeah, I'm kind of biased. Like, Bickerton's not a perfect man. Neither was Cadman. I really don't think either one of them were bad people. They just were not good sometimes because people suck. We that's all have right. skeletons in our closet, every single one of us. And I don't understand why that's such a big deal. So anyway, uh, that's my soapbox. Story. I love it. I think it's so important that you came here and with passion because this is a passion project. Look, I'm telling you folks, I mean, I watched your interview. I can't believe it was 2018 when this interview was on, uh, on, on um, Gospel Tangents and I bought the book. And I think there's a reason why the very first church that I ever stepped in to that was of the Restoration was the Forest Hills Congregation here just north of Tampa. It was the very first church I ever visited. And honestly, I can tell you, I have been blessed by these people. I love them very much. And if this book wasn't written, I probably would have never darkened the door of that church. And so I think you Thanks, played Stephen. very... I didn't know that. Out. Yeah. So this is this look. I mean, the 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 bigger tonight's, they they their this church changed the trajectory of my channel because when I first heard about the songs of Zion, uh, before I even taped my very first episode, uh, an apostle from Independence, Missouri, uh, Patrick McKay, who's not even part of your church, he's independent mm -hmm. restorationist, he shared with me the story, of 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 her. And actually, I got actually I'm just gonna pull this out. So his wife, uh, James. McKay's wife is from our church. Rice, that's yes. right. Yeah. So I just want to share just, you know, Josh Gailey wrote a nice thing to me. They they dedicated, they gave me a copy of the oh, song. The new one. Very cool. Nice. Yeah, last time I was in Florida. And last time he was in Florida. And this is a remarkable story. And your church mm -hmm. is a remarkable story. I think that the the I really do think hopefully one day the history of the church will be written. And I hope that maybe you're the one that writes it, Daniel, or at least inspires somebody to write that history. I don't think, awesome. I will say this nicely. I don't think it's going to be me. I've kind of been told that they will <laughs> never let me do that in a nice way, but they were kind of like, 
yeah, we appreciate your historical experience, but they said, but you're probably not the person to write the history of the church. Okay. <laughs> so I was told, I was told that very nicely. Maybe one day, you know, once my kids get older, I have a lot, a lot of documents. I, I collected more in my research just on Bickerton and I did that on purpose. So that way later on I could do more. So it's still in the making. Do you think you'll, what, to... what do you think you'll do in the future? Like what kind of future project you, you think you might, are you thinking of maybe doing down the road? I mean, I would love to pick up where I left off because the story only gets more interesting when, um, when Alexander Cherry takes over the church oh. after the, re you know, after William Cadman, after William Cadman senior dies and Alexander Cherry takes over, there's a lot of interesting stuff that happens. And there's a lot, unfortunately there's a lot of drama again, which is like, again, I got to talk about it, but it's like, it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting. But in the end, it doesn't, I guess when it comes down to, we still raise our kids in the church mm -hmm. because like it's our family, it's our tribe, right? Like, and we have nothing but good things. The vast majority of people are kind. And even yeah. if I had squabbles with people or people had squabbles with me, I know in the end right now, because it's years later, everything's fine. Yep. And, I've, I, and I, I know several apostles that have been much more, not that they were ever mean to me, but they've been a lot nicer, you know, like, Things ha so basically we're talking about, I want to stress this. We're talking about things that happened like years ago. Right. It's just the kind of the history of the book. We're all good now. Yeah. Like, and I still get fired up a little bit because it does bother me that like, but that people are mean, but I suck sometimes too. So it is what it is. Fair you yeah. can also see where the other historians and what they went through. You could yeah. see why. They yeah. Left. I totally understood. Yeah. Agreed with you. I, yeah. I, we always talked about, we understand why they left because there were times where I did want to leave. I'm not mm. going to lie. And it was because of these things that happened. I just was like, I get it. I'm ready to go. Like, this is crazy. But in the end, I just, why am I going to let, just because I don't agree with how someone is responding. Sometimes when we, even when I'm a jerk, oftentimes when we act like jerks, it's more about what's going on with us than what's going on with other people. We have to always remember that. And also you can't let somebody's opinion of you dictate how you're going to live your life. And that's, that's also takes growing up. And I think every historian, even in the LDS church, the reorganized church, I mean, Bob Flanders, he got rail, he got railed, Von Brody got railed, Leonard Arrington got railed. I mean, you could read that great book about Leonard Arrington by Greg Prince and that biography, the stuff that went on with his life. And even after the fact where the church tried to like take his minutes from the family because they, or from his writings, because they thought he was they like, there's all this conflict and you just realize it's stupid. But we as human beings suck because there's this weight, again, upon us because we have to prove, like, we're the real church. We have to prove that, like, if people want Jesus, they need to come to Jesus through our corporate organization. And that's the way they're going to get salvation. Where to me, at least I'll speak for myself, I don't buy that anymore because of what I've done and written. And it's only increased my faith. It's increased my faith in God. It's increased my faith in Jesus. It's increased my faith just in, like, the spiritual things. And churches, I'm not saying my church isn't true. I'm not saying that the LDS church isn't true. I think there's a lot of truth out there. And I think God is big enough to sort it out. Yep. I agree. I agree with you entirely. And of course, this add into that extra layer of me being from somebody outside of the restoration. And then, then the other, the evangelicals are looking at me like, what, you know, no, they're not, absolutely. They're not Christians. They're of the devil. And like, then I was like, no, no, no. That's like, have you actually read the book of Mormon? You know, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. And I think your church actually is very, is really, to me is, is the place where I feel like where if if you, I tell people there are places that evangelical people from the evangelical world can engage the restoration. It's within that April 6, 1830 gathering that was a room full of born again, spirit filled Christians. OK, them's my people. And then it's also within the pages of the Book of Mormon, because it's a thoroughly Protestant Pentecostal document. I mean, we, you can Chris Thomas's book, you know, it's 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 accessible to spirit filled Christians, especially. So it's like. Let's just have the conversation in that room and have the conversation within the pages of the Book of Mormon. And once you go back to the basic, very beginnings of Mormonism, you will find that it was birthed out of the Second Great Awakening. It was birthed out of Protestantism. It was birthed out of evangelicalism. And unfortunately, there's been this 200-year war between our camps that I think is just quite frankly stupid. And, yeah. uh, you know, I do believe that after 200 years of us going after each other and evangelicals have been nasty towards the restoration and hey they did bad stuff to us too okay i i always hearken back to the very center of the book of mormon which is the anti lehi nephi lanti lehi nephi story where the they bury their weapons of war 
Mm-hmm. And and even though the doc, the Book of Mormon is arguably a war document, at the very center of it is the principles of the Prince of Peace. So all you folks out there, mm-hmm. let's bury our weapons and let's start talking to each other. Daniel Stone, Laura, it's so wonderful you, for you both to come on the show today. Thank you. Thank you. Any final words before I let you go? No, I, I can't mm-hmm. say anything better than that. Okay, that's beautiful. Well, that's awesome. You're awesome human beings. I'm so glad we reconnected, Daniel. At the end of this video, folks, I'll have that link to that interview that we did. It was epic. It was awesome. If you want to learn all you want to know about William Pickerton, it's in there. And make sure you get the book. This is an awesome book. And it's through my friends over at Signature Books, my homies over there. Make sure you go and get the book as well. Now, I have links in the description for you to order the book. Also, there will be links in the description for those of you who would like to purchase our merchandise on our merch store, mormonbookreviews.com. We do also have places for people to financially support the channel, um, Venmo, PayPal, as well as Patreon. And I want to thank all of those of you who are financially supporting the channel. Could not do it without you. And remember, the most important thing is this. All the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.